We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Bob Coleman from Idaho Armored Vaults. Thanks for joining me today, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So these the Basel III regulations that have recently come into effect have really caused almost more confusion than clarity, especially with the recent release of the Reuters article entitled Britain Carves Out Exemption for Gold Clearing Banks from Basel III Rules. So you spent your entire last weekend digging through and trying to understand and, and really clarify these banking regulations and, and gold trading practices. And you wrote an article trying to spell it out as you see it. So as you say in that article, there, there's four main points, four main quotes in that story um, that, that are really worth examining. So we're, we're going to go through those points and, and try and explain this as, as much as we can here. So um, keeping it simple is, is my motto. And I think when you broke that article down and looked at the, the finer details, uh, those four points kind of stood out uh, to me the most. Mm-hmm. So the first point is following a consultation of the Bank of England's Prudential Regulatory Authority or the PRA said on Friday, it had decided to amend its approach to precious metals holdings related to deposit taking and clearing activities. And as you write here, Bob, it's important to separate clearing from deposit taking activities. So the the first quote, it says there, the the PRA has considered the responses and decided to amend its approach to derivative client clearing. The PRA will exempt the NSFR derivative client clearing activities with qualifying CCPs, QCCPs, qualifying central counterparties, provided that the institution does not provide its clients guarantees of the performance of the QCCP and as a result does not incur any funding risk. So I can see why your eyes went cross looking at these these rules and this this verbiage for, for two days straight here, Bob. Yeah, it, that's the hard part is trying to decipher, does this mean unallocated uh, traditional gold programs? Does this mean uh, when they talk about derivatives uh, uh, and forward contracts, does it mean you know, the, the contracts that are traded on the COMEX and, and other similar exchanges? So you try to have to dissect that down a little bit. And I think what, what where they were going with this, especially when they talked about derivatives, last year was a sort of an interesting tell on the activities of the market and where we were heading. Um, when you saw a lot of the metal leave London, for example, or come on to the New York uh, uh, COMEX system, and metal came from all over the world, honestly, uh, it was telling you something was changing there. And and what, what caught my eye was the deleveraging that we started to see where traditionally you had you know maybe 100 to 1 uh, leverage, for example, f- f- paper contracts to to physical metal back in those contracts. Well, especially in 2016, it was really highly levered. When that started to collapse, and you got down to two and a half to one in terms of leverage of of paper contracts to physical metals, it was telling you that that the uh, the system itself was. That the, the structure was was actually a, was changing on a secular basis, uh, and lo and behold, the Basel III uh, um, uh, policies that were coming to, to force uh, this year, well, the changes were already occurring, and so these banks were actually getting out of the business. A lot of these traditional business businesses, or they were just reducing their their uh, their desk, trading desks and so forth uh, in anticipation of this move. And that's where that's where this kind of caught my eye and, and and trying to understand that I, I took this line item that they they talked about uh, clearing was more actually along the lines of the banks actually getting out of the direct counterparty relationship and allowing the exchanges or the qualifying um, uh, central counterparties like uh, the COMEX or the CME, I should say, the the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which owns the COMEX, is an actual CCP. It's a, it, it, so, so what you've seen is the banks are 
allowing the clients to trade with or through them to the CCP where the banks doesn't, they don't have the exposure. All the clearing and, and functions are actually the responsibility of Chicago Mercantile Exchange and not necessarily the bank. And that's where the zero funding uh, percentages start to kick in. It allows the banks to reduce their, their funding requirements because they're not having to take any risk. Uh, they're, they're offloading that risk. And in a way they're, they're transferring that risk, right? Yeah, correct. It's yeah, it's basically the client now is is dealing with an exchange which is which is clearing with another counterparty that's or, or another individual that's trading on that exchange. And so it's it, the, yeah, it's 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 diversifying that risk, I guess, amongst, you know, just like the New York Stock Exchange trading amongst each other and buyers and sellers are being brought together in a forum. And that's the clearing mechanism at this point, rather than just the bank sort of being uh, the market maker and having to uh, be the, 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 the buyer when everyone's selling and sell when everyone's buying. Mm -hmm. So when, when we're, when they're moving this risk onto these CCPs, who are they going to be regulated by and, and who's to ensure that they're able to to actually make these transactions? Uh, are, are you referring to the CCPs themselves? Well, it, let's let's just say if the banks are removing this risk from themselves and transferring it to, for example, like you said, the CME, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or, the, or the COMEX, who, who ensures or, or what ensures that if that risk is transferred to them, that they're able to to clear those um, those contracts. Yeah, the, the CME is regulated by the CFTC, for example, when it comes to futures. Um, if it's uh, yeah, and they, I think they get involved with forward contracts as well. Anything that's tied to margin, um, uh, the CFTC will get involved with, uh, and you know you'll have oversight there. And of course, people forget that. When you're dealing with the CME, is uh, they go through their audits and so forth, and the way they're structured, the clearing firms uh, that uh, are members of uh, an exchange also have eyeballs on the market as well. So they are fully audited uh, and have a financial audit done. And when you're dealing with, for, ex for example, the metals at the COMEX, the, the, the physical custodians have an audit done of the physical holdings. So there's there's multiple layers of transparency, uh, at least on the qualifying exchanges or the, the central counterparties. The issue I think a lot of people have had is the unallocated positions and trading that's going on in London. There's not nearly as much transparency. No one really knows for sure exactly how much metal is really there when you talk about unallocated holdings. Uh, and I think a lot of, there are a lot of uh, uh, individuals that have made claims that it's just very difficult to get that information or the information isn't real time. Uh, there's some sort of delay to it, or it's provided by, uh, you know, the bank of international settlements or, or some other type of regulatory body that's not directly overseeing, uh, gold activity. So that's what makes it really difficult. So that's where, let's say, where that where that information is is very opaque that's where we can get into let's say something that looks like very leveraged contracts and what people consider paper metal right yeah that's that's the part where i think basel 3 attempts to clean up or at least uh, de-risk the bank's balance sheets and these unallocated programs that are supported by the banks and th and that's where that's where the deposit taking activities portions comes from. Um, if you wanted to jump into that art, part, portion of the article that I wrote, um, what, what the, when you talk about interdependent uh, assets and liabilities and so forth, uh, it has to deal with the bank and what they're offering their customer deposits uh, or, or representing as uh, when the customer buys an unallocated uh, gold uh, uh, the, uh, program or buys into that program, what they're actually getting. And what mm -hmm. Basel III, in my opinion, uh, was doing was saying, listen, as long as you buy the physical metal that backs 
the liability side of the balance sheet, meaning if customer A puts $100 into an unallocated gold program, the bank's going to go out and buy $100 worth of gold. Um, and, and as long as they have that relationship, there's a 0% funding requirement because, in essence, the assets and the liabilities offset each other. They, they basically become interdependent. So if the client wants to exit his position, the bank doesn't have any exposure because they ha- – or, or if, the, if the client wants to take delivery of the position, the metal's already sitting there. The, the issue you run into is it doesn't necessarily say that the bank doesn't have to – you know, they can't do uh, leverage unallocated type of uh, uh, trading or 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 uh, services or products that you know they want to offer. But if they do, there would be a funding requirement that may increase their cost of doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as you say in the in the article here, it says banks were motivated to reduce certain unallocated trading practices and corresponding liabilities by simply transferring the trading risk to regulated exchanges and off of their balance sheets. Although they lost proprietary revenues, the cost of reserve funding was removed. In this instance, the customer opens an account and trades through the bank and not with the bank. The only reserves banks need to hold against the customer account is the amount above the minimum margin requirement to maintain the investment. So again, this is this is such such wordy stuff but we're we're trying to clarify it here for the listeners um, yeah. any anything to add there Bob before we move on to the second point um I, I think that you just try to simplify it I mean you you can go in different directions and you can make assumptions uh, just try to keep it simple <laughs> as much as possible yeah. so again let, let's let's maybe try to, to summarize that first point the the, the banks are trying to, there, there's a difference between, let's say, short-term deposits that for the banks need to um, have basically backing for and their their metals accounts, right? Yeah, the, the um, it's important to note that the, the um, this doesn't really pertain to allocated accounts because uh, I looked into that and really, the, every every rule that I found with allocated was basically the bank acts as a custodian. It's not a direct counterparty relationship. Um, the bank doesn't owe you that metal. They're storing it for you. Um, and, and that's that's important to know. And that's why you, you start to break down these these rules and you start to say, okay, what does gold mean when um, the PRA is t- talking about uh, gold? And, and that's why, that's how unallocated, that's why I, the way I, envisioned it was really focused more on the unallocated side. The the second point in your article here, Bob, said that it said it had introduced an interdependent precious metals permission, which would reduce the size of the required capital buffer. So again, you have a, a, a chunk of text here that you took from the article um, and m- maybe just read some and explain it as, as you, as you want here. Yeah. The, the, where where the uh, the PRA was was kind of going into detail on their policy statement, they were talking about the ability for um, uh, or, or clarifying the clearing relationship versus the banking relationship, um, and how you would traditionally have an eighty five percent required stable funding ratio for for gold that's on the balance sheet, and then also how do you get that down to zero percent. Uh, and so th- where it comes into play was identifying whether it's a clearing activity or if it's an interdependent uh, asset liability uh, activity, meaning a, the deposit taking type of activity that's on the ba- bank's balance sheet. So if it's a clearing relationship, again, where the client simply sets up a brokerage account, for example, or a futures account with the bank, they trade th- through the bank. But they don't actually, the bank's not the counterparty. The bank doesn't have any risk. It doesn't guarantee any of the assets that the client's buying because the client's taking all the risk. Uh, It's the qualifying uh, uh, central counterparty that's actually uh, clearing or or responsible for clearing all the buys and sells, just like the COMEX. So it's, you know, if one person sets up a futures account, they trade gold on the COMEX, that's what they're doing. Mm. Um, Versus the, uh, 
the deposit taking side of the business where the bank's offering an unallocated precious metals program, the the uh, the PRA is, is basically saying um, if you fully fund that program with actual metal, uh, so if you have $100 in the unallocated program and customer deposits, you buy $100 worth of gold, you don't have to have any type of reserve funding against that gold because it's the the two offset each other. And again, there there's an important point that you put here. It says this section is ambiguous as it may pertain to allocated or unallocated positions. However, in an allocated setting in London, gold is specifically held and owned by the customer and is not on the balance sheet of the bank. Essentially, the, the account operator, the bank, is acting simply as a custodian. That's le- this leads us to unallocated positions. Yeah, that, that's where I wanted to try and understand these policy statements that are coming out from regulators because they don't necessarily are, they're not very descriptive and specific. Uh, I think they're, they're more guideline oriented so that you will have to almost sort of try to understand what the regulations are covering and what they were going, what, what maybe the direction they were going after for and That's, that's where, uh, you know, when you start to, understand if it's allocated or unallocated, you try to decipher and and remove from the equation the one that you know you can remove. And so the relationship between the bank and the client in an allocated setting, uh, that's more of a custodian relationship where the bank's just simply storing that client's asset. It's not on the asset or it's not on the balance sheet of the bank. Mm -hmm. And and you included a table here of the the reserve funding or RSF um, ratios or or RSF factors, sorry. Um, And it was interesting to me that mortgages require less of an RSF factor than gold does. And and we'll get into the, the, let's say the volatility thing on on the fourth point, but that was just kind of interesting to me as I read through this. Especially after going through the uh, financial crisis in 2008, you think, uh, uh, I mean, some of this stuff, yeah, you think uh, the more things they, like I said at the end of my article, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And exactly as as you stated here, the the question will be if the game of leverage spreads and simply pops up elsewhere. Yeah, perfect. All right, so um, the the third point in the article is this is one of the key points that we've been asking for all these years said one of the LBMA's chief counsels, clearing will be exempt. So what's the importance of that to you, Bob? Well, it doesn't mean that the derivatives market's gonna go away. Um, what, what, it's, what, they're, what they're doing uh, in, in this instance is they're allowing some reprieve um, where it's not impacting the cost of uh, capital, I guess, from the bank's perspective, or you know, the cost of of setting aside reserves uh, by setting up a brokerage account or a futures account, for example, which is an easy way to, to explain this. Um, the the uh, the bank's activities are, you know, the risk taking and so forth is just simply transferred to another entity, and and that's important to note. And and then that's where I get into this whole notion of if we're truly deleveraging. In the in the metals markets, in in the banking activity overall, I mean, you're still always going to have producers selling to banks, you know, financing, collateral financing, all that type of stuff. You're still going to have that, but if if risk is being uh, and leverage is being transferred to these exchanges, the question is, if volume starts to decline on those exchanges and open interest starts to decline on those exchanges. That's where the physical market has more dominance or begins to have more dominance over the overall market. So the uh, the fourth point here says that the PRA said it would not classify gold as a high quality liquid asset, which would have freed other trades as such as precious metals, loans, and leases from the high capital requirement. It's interesting to me that gold, as you point out here, failed only on the volatility basis. So explain to us what that means. And that was kind of what I was a little alluding to earlier. Yeah, to get the full detail of that, you can read the article. So I'll kind of summarize. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, there were some, some, some studies done 
uh, that tried to look at the price action of, of gold. And in order to do that, some of the best study or some of the, the, the best uh, areas to look for was the exchanges, the regulated exchanges, because they had, uh, uh, they had a fluent and uh, auditable uh, record of pricing. Well, the problem with that is that um, the volatility of uh, uh, when you're talking about the futures market, one study actually focused on the futures market, is you don't have 100% of the trading done on that market for the resiliency of gold itself. You, you have you know, a lot of liquid or leveraged uh, uh, trades that are done to try and captivate on short-term trading activities, hedging, uh, 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 momentum trading, people that are just buying the metal purely for the price action, not necessarily because it's a, uh, a safe haven asset, that type of thing. So oddly enough, when Basel committee looked at the, um, the price action and so forth, gold does very, it's sort of what they call an asymmetric type of, of, uh, of volatility where when you have a positive shock to the system, something good happens in the world, Gold doesn't do very well. In fact, it goes down pretty hard, for example, versus when there's a negative shock, shock to the system, gold does very well. It tends to act as that safe haven. And so the Basel Committee doesn't look at gold because of the volatility of the positive side. It, it reduces its, its viability as a high quality liquid asset, which is just funny because in the article I wrote, the whole idea of this Basel three risk the leveraging of the system is to look at the idea of risk or assets and, and the negative shocks that happen to the system and the effect of that asset. So they're basically eliminating the one asset that actually has a very positive correlation to a negative shock. Yeah, you, you wrote it very well in the article. It says, isn't the idea of a strong balance sheet during times of crisis having assets that perform during that crisis? I think that's a, that's a perfect way to put it. And as I was reading that part too, Bob, it, it just kind of it really stuck out to me considering that, let's say, as, as you put, if, if the metals and, and gold are being manipulated and that, that is the basis of why, or, or let's say the, the basis for the study that was made on gold not performing um, or, or being too volatile, let's say, that seems kind of counterproductive, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's why I, 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 um, I made the comment. It's like you know when you're looking at futures pricing and and volatility of of the price of the metals. It's like measuring a feather in a wind tunnel. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. It, there's a lot of frantic activity that has absolutely nothing to do with the actual underlying asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and that and that's why I think that's what frustrates us physical metal owners versus the paper world uh, because. You know, for for the physical metal owner, it's a zero sum game. It, it, there's only so much metal out there. You can't, you know, if you don't have it, you don't have it. Uh, but yet, in the in the leverage world of paper, you can create out of thin air, and that's that's what and and that dictates the actual price of the underlying physical asset. And I think that's the that, that's what uh, uh, you know, frustrates us the most. Yeah, absolutely, and. One one other piece I'd like to to get into here, Bob, is that at the end you say that the bottom line is that the Basel III is voluntary and can be adjusted by each regulating body in each country. So why is it? Let's let's take that first part. Why is it voluntary? Well, from what from what I've read through Basel is that it's basically a a, a guideline or a mandate of guidelines. And thirdly. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. That they want each country to follow. But it's up to the regulatory bodies of those countries to implement th that structure. And th that's that's a distinction. Um, it's not just simply everything basically, basically is created out of the Bank of International Settlements and everyone else has to follow. There is actually each country has its own uh, regulatory Body, for instance, the you know I, I even went into the uh, comments done on the Federal Register uh, when it came to Basel III and the comments that were being made. You could see that that there there was each country had its own 
commentary structure and and fr- from the industry and its peers and so forth. So there's there is some negotiation I think that goes on behind the scenes and I think that's why this article when it came out I think the LBMA was was um, somewhat instrumental or or lobbying in their interest obviously to reduce cost structure so that, that this regulation wouldn't hamper their activities. Mm-hmm. Excellent Bob. Well um, is there anything else that you'd like to add here that basically sums this up? So let, maybe let's start with what does this ultimately mean for the LBMA? Um, for the LBMA, I, I would imagine I mean, it's business kind of goes on. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, the, the, the transparency may start to, you know, the, the market may start to demand more transparency from them. Um, it, it's not uh, it's not traditional business as usual as it was five, 10 years ago. Uh, and you have players that are actually have left the business uh, or reducing their, 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 their business activities in the unallocated markets and shifting that to equity trading desks or currency trading desks and so forth. Um, so you, you have, you, you have some of this, deleveraging that's that's ongoing i think what this what for the for the average investor out there you have to look at this not from a short term perspective, perspective because there's a lot of uh, proponents and and promoters and and uh, spokespeople out there that try to, to give you the inference that this is going to set the metals on fire and it's going to go to the moon and it's going to the banks are going to crash and burn and 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 the derivatives business is going to fold that's not ha- it's it's that's not what this is about. You have a structural theme that's playing out. That's actually, uh, th- I think, as the world's you know all this expansion of balance sheets of, of central banks and so forth. I think Basil's trying to look at this from a longer term perspective and saying, listen, when this game unwinds, we want the banks to be as strong as they can be when that happens. And so that's why if you look at this from a longer term perspective, the, the deleveraging of the metals markets makes a lot of sense to me. And, 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 and that actually will be beneficial for the physical metals down the road. It, it may not happen as soon as we all like, but, but the, the theme is that the market and the structure is changing. It's it's uh, it's kind of interesting you you bring up that point about the the deleveraging of of banks. I'm reading a book right now called the the Lords of Finance, and in it they're going through uh, the part that I'm in right now. They're going through basically around the the First World War and Second World War and how the English banks, the French banks, the German banks, all and especially the the American banks actually as well, um, all really what the structural um, imbalances were and and risks. And exactly as you're saying, this is trying to get get the banks to be a little bit more resilient if if and when this this system blows up, right? Yeah, because it, obviously we're burning the candle at both ends. You can't have the expansion of of money supply and and broad money, base money, all these types of measurements. Uh, negative interest rates in parts of the world, zero interest rates. I mean, you're burning the savers up. I mean, all of these th- types of things uh, are are going to have an effect at some point. We don't know when. And and to me personally, I think uh, uh, the the market will will ultimately decide when the printing press should be taken away. And the moment that happens, tax rates are going to go up. You're going to have a, a a shift there. Uh, and that's why I continually always uh, try to educate people to understand where your money is, what the program you're you're involved with, uh, especially with precious metals. You know, does the program have any type of financing financing activity, leverage, or leasing, or anything of that, of that matter? Because you want to understand your counterparty, you want to understand the structure, um, uh, and definitely want the transparency. So, uh, who knows when that day is going to come? But it's all intertwined. I mean, that, that's, you know, you, you see this picture kind of this slow motion train wreck, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to put it, Bob. And of course, um, you know, this is an, an evolving process. Um, you have been excellent about trying to answer people's questions. And I, I really want to thank you for that because you're, you're just trying to help 
educate people as, as are we at uh, Palisades Gold Radio, right? Sure. Um, of course, you're available on Twitter at Profits Plus ID. Um, you're, you're very active on there. You answer a lot of questions. Um, anywhere else you, you want to point people towards, Bob? Um, they could go to our website. Uh, uh, we have a blog as well as sort of an interview and, and article section. So uh, goldsilvervault.com, just all one word. Uh, that's a great place for some information. And then people could always contact us as well. So definitely, you know, my, my goal is I don't want to see people get hurt out there. I want them to be, you know, to have the best experience as possible, especially in the, in the physical metals asset class, because I think it's a wonderful asset class. I think there's a lot of uh, it offers a lot of uh, diversity uh, that you just can't get in the paper world. Excellent. All right, Bob. Um, of course, we'll we'll link to your article and and any relevant stuff here in the show notes. Thanks so much for taking the time to try and try and bring this complicated subject to light, Bob. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.